In the 1930s, American streamliners turned heads with their breathtaking speed and flawless curves, redefining what a train could be. But beneath the polished steel lay a hidden engineering flaw, one so costly and crippling that it sealed the fate of an entire era. These icons vanished, not for lack of beauty, but because their brilliance hid a secret that made survival impossible in the real world. How did a design built to dazzle become its own undoing? The answer rewrites everything you thought you knew about the age of the streamliner. In February 1934, a gleaming silver shape rolled out of the Pullman Standard Factory in Chicago, unlike anything the American public had seen. Union Pacific's M1000, wrapped in lightweight aluminum and styled with a pointed nose, looked more like something from a Buck Rogers cereal than a railroad timetable. It was the first of its kind, a streamlined diesel-powered train designed to slice through the air in the competition. The press called it the Tomorrow Train. Newspapers ran photos of its wind tunnel tests, and crowds gathered just to glimpse its smooth, unbroken lines as it glided past. Just three months later, the Burlington Zephyr made headlines of its own. On May 26, 1934, the Zephyr roared out of Denver at dawn, headed for Chicago. The challenge was to cover over a thousand miles in a single day without stopping for coal or water. By the time it pulled into Chicago's Century of Progress exposition, the Zephyr had shattered records, 1,015 miles in just over 13 hours, averaging nearly 78 miles an hour. For the first time, a train had crossed the Great Plains faster than a commercial airplane. People cheered at every station. Radio announcers called it the dawn to dusk dash. These new streamliners did not just promise speed, they promised a new era. Their bodies were shaped by science, not tradition, with every curve and flare designed to minimize wind resistance. Inside, passengers found air conditioning, reclining seats, and panoramic windows. The Zephyr's stainless steel skin gleamed in the sunlight, a moving billboard for the future. Railroads raced to commission their own versions, each hoping to outdo the last in both style and performance. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford's Comet, the Milwaukee Road's Hiawatha, and the Pennsylvania Railroad's Torpedo all followed, each with its own signature look and headline-grabbing speed. Streamliners became the face of progress, brochures boasted of coast-to-coast -coast journeys in comfort and style. Industrial designers like Raymond Lowy and Henry Dreyfus lent their names and their vision, turning locomotives into rolling works of art. The public fell in love. Model train sets, magazine covers, and Hollywood films all featured these sleek machines. For a moment, the future of rail travel seemed shaped from polished steel, racing across a continent, and carrying with it the hopes of a nation looking for speed, beauty, and a little bit of magic. In the depths of the Great Depression, American railroads faced a crisis of confidence. Highways were stretching farther every year, and the first commercial airlines were already skimming above the clouds. Railroads needed a way to recapture the public's imagination, and they found it in the promise of speed and style. The answer was not just faster engines or lighter cars. It was beauty, engineered. Railroad executives turned to the rising stars of industrial design. Raymond Lowy, already famous for his work with Lucky Strike and Coca-Cola, signed on with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Henry Dreyfus, known for his streamlined telephones and clocks, brought his vision to the New York Central. These designers were not just sketching trains, they were crafting icons. Lowy's GG1 and Dreyfus's Hudson became rolling sculptures, each curve and contour calculated to evoke motion, even when standing still. Their contracts ran into the tens of thousands, unheard of in the railroad world. And their names appeared in full-page ads beside the locomotives they shaped. Railroads poured money into national advertising campaigns. Magazine spreads promised a new era of travel, where the journey was as glamorous as the destination. Brochures boasted of silken rides 
and whisper quiet comfort. The Burlington Roots Zephyr was promoted as a stainless steel miracle, its livery gleaming in every photo. Union Pacific's M1000 became the centerpiece of parades and world's fairs. Even the ride itself became a selling point. Air conditioning, reclining seats, and panoramic windows were presented as marvels of modern engineering. The public responded with enthusiasm. Passenger counts surged on the new streamliner routes, filling trains from Chicago to Los Angeles and New York to Miami. Model train manufacturers scrambled to keep up with demand, releasing miniature Zephyrs and Hiawathas for living room floors across the country. Hollywood took notice, casting streamliners as the backdrop for romance and adventure. In the minds of millions, the streamlined train became the very image of progress, a symbol of American ingenuity and optimism. For a brief shining period, beauty became a business strategy. Railroads measured success, not just in miles per hour or tonnage hauled, but in the number of magazine covers and the volume of fan mail. The streamliner's sculpted nose and polished sides set a new standard. Any railroad that did not keep up risked looking old-fashioned overnight. Industrial designers held rare influence, shaping not only the trains themselves, but the public's expectations of what modern travel should feel like. The race for elegance and speed was on, and no one wanted to be left behind. Inside the shops at Collinwood or Cleburne, a full car body locomotive meant that a day's work could turn into a week's ordeal. Mechanics faced a wall of polished steel, with the engine buried deep behind sculpted panels and cramped walkways. The job everyone dreaded was the HLP pull, removing the head, liner, and piston from a cylinder. In a hood unit, a crane could lift the whole power assembly in one go. But with an F unit, maintenance was anything but simple. First, the mechanic squeezed past hot manifolds, unbolted the cylinder head, then wrestled the liner free by hand, fighting for every inch. Only then could the piston be coaxed out, piece by awkward piece. Shop logs from the 1950s show overtime hours piling up for these repairs. A single HLP job could swallow an entire shift, sometimes more, while the engine sat idle and the railroad lost money. One veteran recalled that they should be paid by the contusion because you just try getting the head off a number five cylinder in July. With shop air thick with sweat and curses, a simple fix on a modern engine became a marathon inside a streamliner. The beauty of the design was skin deep. Beneath it, every maintenance call became a test of patience and endurance. Mechanics learned to improvise with custom tools and brute strength, but nothing could change the fact that the engine was trapped. For every hour spent in the shop, the promise of speed and glamour faded a little more, replaced by frustration and mounting costs. The arrival of the hood unit transformed life in the railroad shops. Instead of wrestling for hours inside a sealed steel shell, mechanics could now walk up to the engine from either side. Large hinged doors swung open to reveal the machinery. The real breakthrough came with the removable power assembly. In a hood unit, a mechanic could unbolt an entire cylinder set, head, liner, and piston together, and a shop crane would lift the whole bundle straight out. What used to swallow a full day's labor could now be done before lunch. Maintenance logs from the 1970s show a clear pattern. Jobs that once tied up a crew for eight or 10 hours dropped to just two or three. The difference was more than convenience, it was the difference between a locomotive sitting idle for days and one rolling out of the shop by afternoon. One museum curator standing beside a restored GP series hood unit puts it simply. When the head, liner, and piston come out together, it is a new world. The design was not just about making repairs faster. It meant fewer injuries, less overtime, and more engines back on the rails earning money. The removable power assembly became the industry standard, copied by every major builder. Cranes, once useless in the cramped confines of a streamliner, now became essential shop tools. 
mechanics could finally focus on the work itself, not on fighting the locomotive body. This leap in efficiency did not just help the shops. It changed how railroads thought about their equipment. Engines were no longer trapped behind layers of sculpted steel. The hood unit's open design set the stage for a new era of practical, hard-working locomotives, ready for whatever the railroad demanded next. For crews working freight, the shape of a locomotive was more than a matter of taste. It could mean the difference between a safe shift and a dangerous one. Streamlined engines, with their full-width bodies and sculpted noses, looked impressive from the platform, but they created real headaches out in the yard. From the engineer's seat, rearward visibility was nearly non-existent. The solid, sweeping bodywork blocked any view of the train behind, forcing engineers to rely on hand signals or guesswork when reversing or coupling cars. Brakemen, whose job was to climb down and handle switches or knuckles, found themselves stepping onto narrow ladders and slippery surfaces, sometimes with nothing but a curved metal skin between them and the ballast below. The arrival of the hood unit changed the equation. Instead of a wall of sheet metal, these locomotives featured long, narrow walkways running the length of the engine. Wide, sturdy steps at each end let crew members move safely from ground to cab, even while the train was in motion. Handrails and grab irons were placed exactly where they were needed, making it possible for brakemen to ride along or step off quickly during switching moves. Engineers gained clear sight lines down both sides and to the rear, making it easier to spot signals, watch for obstacles, and communicate with ground crews. Railroad unions took note. Meeting minutes from the late 1950s and early 1960s record repeated calls for locomotives that offered better visibility and safer footing. Injuries dropped as new engines with walkways replaced the old full-bodied streamliners. The hood unit's practical design did not just help in the shop. It made every day safer for the people who ran the trains. For a railroad shifting focus from passenger service to freight, these working advantages mattered far more than a polished nose or a famous designer's signature. By the late 1960s, the business case for streamliners was crumbling. Airlines and highways had siphoned away most long-distance passengers, leaving the ornate trains half-empty on their once-proud routes. Railroads faced a hard truth. The cost of beauty was no longer paying for itself. Each sculpted nose, once a badge of prestige, became a liability the moment it was dented or cracked. Repairing a damaged streamliner nose could cost three to five times more than fixing a standard hood unit. Insurance adjusters, faced with mounting bills, began writing off entire locomotives after moderate accidents, rather than authorizing expensive rebuilds. In 1971, the creation of Amtrak marked the end of private railroads' responsibility for passenger service. With that, the incentive to maintain or commission stylish, high-maintenance engines vanished almost overnight. Railroad executives, under pressure to cut losses, shifted investment to practical, boxy locomotives that could be repaired quickly and cheaply. The era of the streamliner, once driven by image and public appeal, was undone by the cold math of the balance sheet. On a cold February morning in 1956, disaster struck on the Rockville Bridge. A Pennsylvania Railroad passenger train, led by a streamlined F unit, derailed and collided with a freight car. The pointed nose, designed for speed and beauty, acted like a wedge. Instead of absorbing the blow, it rode up and over the other car's frame, crushing the cab and pushing deadly force into the crew compartment. Investigators from the Interstate Commerce Commission called out the flaw in their final report. The sloped, ramped nose had turned a crash into a catastrophe. Decades later, engineers at the Transportation Technology Center in Pueblo, Colorado, recreated these collisions and controlled tests. Streamlined noses failed every time climbing over obstacles, and driving deep into the heart of passenger cars. By the 1990s, the Federal Railroad Administration wrote new rules, 49 CFR 238, 
demanding anti-climb technology and reinforced front ends. The law was clear. Any locomotive nose that could override another car was disqualified from passenger service. The classic streamliner form, once a symbol of progress, had become a legal impossibility. Thousands of miles from North America's rail yards, a different story played out in the heart of Australia. In 1971, Commonwealth Railways introduced the NJ-class diesel-electric locomotive to tackle the punishing conditions of the outback. Here, the challenge wasn't just distance or heat, it was dust. Fine red sand swept across the tracks, finding its way into every exposed crevice of traditional engines. Open walkways and removable panels, so prized elsewhere for maintenance access, became liabilities. Engines clogged, filters choked, and bearings wore out in half the time. The NJ class answered with a sealed, full car body design. Pressurized engine compartments and filtered air intakes kept dust at bay, allowing these locomotives to run for weeks between major cleanings. Maintenance logs from the 1970s and the 1980s show that these units outlasted their open-bodied counterparts, with fewer breakdowns and longer intervals between overhauls. In this environment, the very feature that doomed streamliners elsewhere, their enclosed, sculpted shells, became their greatest strength. The lesson is simple. Engineering is never one size fits all. What fails in Chicago or Philadelphia might thrive in Alice Springs. The fate of the streamliner wasn't sealed by beauty or by flaw alone, but by how well its design met the demands of its world. In the end, every locomotive is a compromise between elegance, function, and the harsh realities of the track ahead. Today, every locomotive design is a balance of innovation and unforgiving reality. When beauty clashes with safety and efficiency, regulations and economics decide what survives. The streamliner's fate is a warning. Engineering choices echo far beyond aesthetics. As railroads evolve, one question remains. Will we keep learning from yesterday's overlooked flaws? Or will the next icon hide a new price? Share your thoughts below.